Good morning and good afternoon. Uh, my name is Bjorn Klaus and I'm director of Electronics Watch. Uh, welcome to today's webinar on suicide and employment conditions in the Chinese electronics sector. We are really happy for the tremendous interest in this webinar from uh, business, civil society, public buyers. And let me say from the start uh, that we hope that this webinar will be the launching pad for a collaboration to address the working conditions that contribute to the risk of suicide and to make a substantial progress in this area together. As you will have noticed, um, Let's see now if I can move my slides. Yes, there we go. As you will have noticed, all participants are on mute. Uh, however, there will be two ways that you can participate. If you have a question for the presenters, uh, you can send a chat message privately to Peter Pavlicki. He appears as Peter Pavlicki Electronics Watch on your, on your participant list. And you can send a question to him at any time and Peter will then read your question to the presenter at the end of the presentation. Then if you have any technical problems, technical questions of any kind, then please send uh, a chat to Martina Hooper of Electronics Watch and she will solve your problems promptly. And um, just so you know, this webinar is being recorded and uh, so you will be able to hear it again or you will be able to share it with colleagues who may have uh, missed it. Uh, it will be available on our website, on the Electronics Watch website. So Electronics Watch is an independent monitoring organization that helps public sector buyers work together to protect the labor rights and safety of workers in their electronic supply chains. There are more than 200 public sector buyers in Europe that share the cost of monitoring their supply chains and coordinate engagement with industry through Electronics Watch. Education is vital to this process and this webinar series on socially responsible public procurement sheds light on some key issues for a public procurement. The first webinar this year addressed supply chain transparency and the second, responsible mining. Uh, both those webinars are accessible on our website. We also look forward to the fourth webinar in this series on September 18th, which will look closer at what public buyers can do to promote safe working conditions in their supply chains. We're grateful to two expert presenters who will be joining us then. Pauline Götter with the Swedish County Councils and Sanjeev Pandita with the Asian Network for Occupational and Environmental Victims and ROEF. Today's topic is a tragic one, employee suicide in the Chinese electronics sector. It is a moral imperative to take all necessary steps to reduce the risk of suicides in workplaces. At the same time, suicides can be an indicator of severe labor rights issues in workplaces. Therefore, focusing on identifying and addressing root causes of suicide can lead to reforms that benefit all workers. Today's presentation is based on thorough and groundbreaking research by Electronics Watch monitoring partner, the Economic Rights Institute. We are also grateful to Bread for All in Switzerland for funding part of this research. The findings that will be presented to today are based on an analysis of internet postings of over 167 suicide incidents and suicide protests, and on-site employee surveys of 44 suppliers with more than 5,500 workers, and off-site interviews with 252 workers at four high-risk suppliers. Remarkably, this research has now succeeded in identifying systemic links between employment conditions and employment and employee suicides in the electronics sector. Although, as you will hear, there is much more analysis to be done on this issue. This analysis will be the subject of a forthcoming report, The Missing Link, by e Economic Rights Institute and Electronics Watch. Uh, today's presenter, is Dimitri Kessler. He is a founder of the Economic Rights Institute. Dimitri received a doctoral degree from the University of Wisconsin in Madison in the United States in the sociology of economic development, where his studies centered on Chinese development and workers' rights. 
He has worked with a variety of British, Dutch, US, and Swiss code of conduct organizations until he founded the Economic Rights Institute in 2012. Thank you so much, Dimitri, for being with us today. And um, now it's over to your presentation. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Bowen. Let me share my screen here. So I very much appreciate uh, the time that people are spending uh, to join us, and I hope that this will be a uh, productive use of your time. Uh, as Bjorn mentioned, our, our goal here is, is we're very much forward uh, thinking and hope that we can build constructive collaboration to help resolve some of the issues that we're bringing attention to. Uh, I know that some have expressed concern that suicide is a, maybe like child labor, is an issue that is uh, easily sensationalized. Uh, we definitely don't want to do that. We focus on suicide here um, since the Evans evidence has brought this issue uh, to our attention. Uh, that said, suicide is always complicated. Uh, we don't mean to oversimplify these suicides. Uh, we focus on the role of employment conditions because that's uh, where we think there's a discussion to be had about responsibilities. Um, I would also like to um, just add, we're talking about suicide in the electronics sector because this is, uh, for Electronics Watch, it's a conscious choice uh, to focus on the electronics sector. Uh, for Economic Rights Institute, some of the work that we do extends beyond electronics, but we have a scale uh, of data uh, in the electronics sector, which we just don't have for other sectors. So uh, I don't really want to comment on the risk of suicide in other sectors or suggest by our focus on electronics that the risk of suicide is higher in electronics. Uh, I have thoughts on that, but those are more sort of... Uh, um, hints and feelings and really what we want to focus on is the evidence that we have within the electronic sector. So please don't um, uh, maybe o overread that, uh, that presentation or that focus to think that uh, we're suggesting the problem of suicide doesn't exist outside of electronics. Um, now for uh, reference in the future, I, I have this slide here. You can uh, go back to um, uh, this presentation if you find some of the evidence interesting or if you want to have a deeper look at some of the graphs that we provide, um, for example. Um, so I think that it's important to begin this conversation by talking about uh, Foxconn. And uh, actually, uh, Foxconn was not part of our study. We did not uh, visit Foxconn. We didn't complete uh, surveys there. We didn't do field work there. Our focus is very consciously not Foxconn. We're trying to show that the issue of suicide extends beyond uh, uh, Foxconn. But the reason why we need to begin with this discussion here is that uh, the, uh, the spike of suicides that Foxconn experienced in 2010 got a lot of publicity and it really uh, represented a turning point, uh, not just in sort of public perceptions of the risk of suicide in the Chinese electronics sector, but even I think in the, the, the trends of Chinese suicide. Now, this is a little bit hard to judge because um, we don't, the, the information is always a bit spotty, so we don't know to what extent we're talking about suicide or talking about publicly or uh, reports of suicide. There, there may be a gap there. But for example, there was a 2008 study uh, of the suicides among Chinese youth that showed that only 1% of, uh, of uh, youth who committed suicide were jumping from buildings, but that's closer to 90% of the Foxconn suicides. Uh, and that, that trend uh, is consistent with suicides outside of Foxconn. So really uh, it's possibly the publicity, but something happened in 2010 that has shifted um, either trends in suicide or at the very least perceptions of suicide. And that happens, that happens worldwide. It also exists at the level of workers and employers. Um, when this suicide started happening in 2010 in, in Foxconn in a way that, that uh, drew people's attention, the government was very concerned. They sent over 200 uh, officers to visit Foxconn to try to identify the source of the problem. Uh, the problem got worse in the early part of 2010 with seven people uh, attempting a suicide in May of 2010. And under that pressure, uh, 
uh, by June, uh, the government had uh, sort of convinced Foxconn to pledge to improve employee income by 20%. Now we're going to revisit these concepts here. What is the appropriate response to uh, employee suicides? Uh, so please keep that question in your minds. Um, there was a lot, of course, of discussion about whether or not Foxconn should be held responsible for the suicides. We're not going to talk about Foxconn, but I want to mention the, uh, some of the ideas because they're relevant to our question, our core question uh, for this study is, uh, do employment conditions contribute to uh, employee suicide? So, of course, there were workers' rights groups who kind of pointed a finger to what they considered appalling conditions in Foxconn. Uh, I should note here that Foxconn is known to have sort of better than average conditions uh, in terms of income, uh, for example, uh, or some other issues. Um, but uh, still workers' rights groups were able to point to uh, very serious issues. Uh, and they also doubted that Foxconn was improving. Uh, and they used these arguments to suggest Foxconn is contributing. It's the employment conditions which are creating this risk of suicide. Uh, what is very difficult to understand if you look back at this graph here is if conditions in Foxconn didn't change, why do we see that suicides fell after 2010? Uh, they, they were still high in 2011, but then they very uh, significantly dropped in the years later, and we see now very sporadic suicides. Um, in more sort of uh, business circles, uh, and as well as in some uh, more conservative uh, news outlets, there was a focus on uh, the norm of suicide within Chinese society. And the, the more concrete reference was to a national average uh, Chinese suicides were quite high, maybe 10 or 20 years ago, they have dropped. And then now national average sits at roughly 15 suicides per 100,000 uh, people. Now Foxconn employs, or at the time, employed uh, roughly 1 million uh, Chinese people. So the idea that they might see 20 people commit suicide in a year uh, still seems within the quote unquote norm. Now, uh, I highlight this, uh, again, not to talk about Foxconn, but because it's going, this, this idea is going to come up as we try to understand the findings that we have on suicides outside of Foxconn. Um, in China, uh, studies suggest that over 40% of suicides are of elderly people 60 or 65 years and older. Likewise, uh, the vast majority of uh, suicides by Chinese youth occur in the countryside, not in uh, the cities. So it's really, uh, it's actually not a very uh, sort of properly scientific use of this national average of 15 suicides per 100,000 citizens to apply that to a situation where you're talking about uh, young people employed in the cities. Uh, but let's even put that aside. If we were to consider it a norm for a, a, a large employer, uh, to experience a certain number of suicides, we still also have to ask ourselves, why were there not these suicides before 2010, or not, not at least not at that level? And why did they drop? Why did the trend uh, uh, decline after 2010? Um, here, um, a key concept which we'll return to uh, is called the Werther effect. Uh, I won't get into the history, but uh, essentially the concept is uh, there is evidence to support this that when uh, there is a lot of publicity surrounding a suicide, that in and itself can lower the mental threshold uh, for others who are maybe in depressed circumstances or, or um, uh, stressed or feeling hopeless uh, or, or, or simply uh, sort of inspired to copycat, that they will also commit suicide. So publicity around suicides is a known risk for new suicides. Uh, and there's some evidence directly linked to the Foxconn experience to suggest that that spike in May 2010 uh, was related to the publicity surrounding those suicides. Um, we'll come back to that. Now, uh, despite the tragedies uh, of 2010, uh, we see that the um, CEO of Foxconn in 2014, so well after the suicides had declined, 
uh, he spoke about the suicides in this way, and it's very clear that he did not feel that employment conditions uh, played a, a major role in, in that, that suicide spike. He said it wasn't because workers were tired, some of it was because the work is monotonous. Uh, we'll return to these concepts as well. Uh, but 90% of the suicides uh, were due to personal relationships or family disputes. And that's a way, I think, of psychologizing or, or individualizing uh, the stress or the triggers um, that bring people to commit suicide. I think that's quite important that despite uh, this very public um, uh, situation, this very intense and dramatic uh, tragedy that occurred with so many suicides uh, in a so-called cluster, uh, we still don't see a, a clear recognition for the, the, the possible role of employment conditions, or at least there's a lot of questions about that. That said, it's significant, I think, in this short quote that uh, Terry Gull uh, mentions that the monotony of work and we see that since then, Foxconn has really invested uh, quite uh, dramatically in automation and hopes to automate 30% of their Chinese production by 2020. So that is, could be considered partly a response to reducing this risk um, to do away with the work that, that seems sort of uh, to, to inspire uh, this deep resistance by, by people when they need to do the work manually. Um, and we need to think about that also in terms of the responses that we seek to uh, wider suicides when we, when we look more widely. Now, uh, just to review, so the study that we did, again, it does not include Foxconn, uh, but was quite uh, extensive. We looked at uh, internet sources, so public reports of suicides in the electronic sector, uh, that the, the range of incidents we uh, saw covered about a span of 10 years from around 2007 to 2017. Uh, we found uh, 100, over 160 incidents of suicide or attempted suicide. Uh, this included a significant number of suicide protests. <laughs> These typically would be where a group of workers would, for example, climb to the, building of a roo uh, to the roof of a building and threaten to jump. Um, and we looked at this to try to understand at least the public reporting of suicides and the motives uh, behind those suicides. We did extensive surveys uh, which were focused on employment conditions but where we knew uh, a number of factories had experienced suicides and so we tried to identify very concretely which employment conditions uh, are linked to the risk of suicide. And uh, then we also uh, tried to use uh, the, the things that we learned from the previous work uh, to uh, uh, identify high-risk uh, factories. We chose four suppliers where we thought the risk of suicide is higher, and we did uh, field work off-site interviews with workers there <coughs> to test the methodology of identifying the risk of suicide and try to verify the link to employment conditions. Um, one of the things that we can see is that <laughs> Despite the publicity uh, for the Foxconn suicides, uh, there is a very obvious trend of a growing trend of suicides up until, let's say, 2015, um, out in other factories, in other electronics factories that are uh, mostly sort of under the radar and not discussed. Uh, we believe that employment conditions contribute to suicides and that this is very directly related to the repression of workers' rights by the government, but also by employers, that they, um, for example, uh, refuse to give workers time off or uh, uh, restrict workers' freedom to resign and uh, repress sort of workers' efforts to, to bargain collectively with employers over the conditions of their work, and this uh, very directly contributes to the risk of suicide. Uh, we identified two cycles of influence. Um, uh, I think we have more conclusive evidence on this first cycle where we see that uh, because factories are trying to push uh, their productivity, they tend to, some, some factories will resort to more coercive forms of discipline. That leads to tensions between workers, supervisors, and security personnel, which leads to outright conflicts and even violence as well as differences in income uh, as uh, supervisors kind of give privileges to some and then punish others. And this contributes to anxiety and depression, which is linked to uh, 
uh, worker suicides. Uh, uh, we see another cycle of influence where we have, I think, less conclusive evidence, but certainly suggestive evidence that uh, when uh, factories that are experiencing high variation in their orders, they prefer short-term employment. They tend to overuse uh, sort of independent recruiters and labor contracting, student internships, uh, or they otherwise promote sort of poor employee retention uh, in order to cycle through their uh, workforce more quickly. And this promotes uh, both the risk of workers of being victimized in disputes as well as insecurity in their personal lives. So that the sort of personal relationships that Terry Gao was talking about don't necessarily sort of do away with that question of do employment conditions contribute to the risk of suicide. A few of our findings, uh, I mentioned that uh, uh, workers uh, sometimes, co often collectively, it can be a handful of workers, it is sometimes a hundred or more workers will climb to the roof of a building and uh, suggest that they're going to jump from the building in order to try to pressure employers to resolve disputes. Uh, what's very interesting about this is that this very obviously peaked in uh, 2015, where there were 14 reported incidents. Again, it's a little hard. We don't know how much we're seeing a change in the public reporting of these incidents. It's possibly that these protests existed before 2015, but were just going underreported. And then the reporting improved as people paid more attention to the issue of suicide. It's also possible that there was a spike as publicity around suicides kind of uh, grew, uh, that more and more workers found this a useful way to try to pressure work, uh, employers uh, to resolve disputes. We definitely see this spike. Um, and then we see both the, the number of per suicide protests as well as the number of suicides drive off significantly. Uh, we believe this is a, a reflection of censorship. There may be other issues uh, in the trends of suicide, but censorship is clearly a strong influence on uh, the, the, the discourse around suicides. Um, employers will seize evidence. They will bribe workers. They'll fire them there or simply just pressure them not to talk about uh, suicides that they may have witnessed. Police will arrest and sometimes even beat up uh, family members uh, who come to protest employers where they've had a, a loved one commit suicide. Uh, both employers and the government will sometimes use the incentive of some kind of restitution package offered to survivors uh, to pressure them to not speak about the suicide so that accepting some form of restitution is dependent on their agreeing to never talk to journalists journalists or not to otherwise seek uh, support uh, to, to kind of seek better restitution, for example. Um, the police often will not report incidents or prevent uh, journalists from, from in interviewing people on the scene. And we also see quite uh, significantly uh, internet and telephone references deleted. Inconsistently, there's still a lot of public reports of suicide as this study shows, uh, but a lot of uh, references do get deleted uh, we're not entirely sure why. Uh, the question of fatigue came up in Terry Gold's comments. I think uh, here it's important to recognize that uh, the, the link between employment conditions and suicide is not necessarily commonsensical. It's easy to think, oh, when workers work long hours, then they commit suicide. Uh, we don't see an obvious link between the number of hours workers work and suicides. What we do see is that, it, it, at least in the, the uh, public reports of suicides, we found 10% of them referred to workers committing suicide soon after or immediately after they were denied permission for time off. And if we look at those stories, uh, we see a number of things related to that. Uh, sometimes workers feel that they're stressed. They themselves want uh, to take a break, uh, but they're denied that opportunity. Sometimes workers are seeking an opportunity to visit family and they often uh, these moments are rare in with Chinese migration being what it is uh, so that's also a significant deprivation uh, and then of course obviously uh, these uh, workers requests for time off often provoke tensions with supervisors and disputes which can be over fines connected to workers uh, missing work without permission getting fired withheld income and these kinds of things um, 
Now we move into maybe some more uh, of our survey results where we try to be much more precise about the effects of employment conditions uh, on, on suicide. One of the clear things that we need to uh, point out is that suicide is not just an individual phenomenon. Obviously, uh, it takes an individual to make that step, to, to feel uh, that, that level of, of, of uh, depression or hopelessness uh, and, and to seek to end their lives uh, that way. But we very clearly see that uh, factories where suicides have occurred have common traits that set them apart from factories where suicides have not occurred. And if we look at this, uh, we have a data set of about 44 factories where we know 11 of those factories uh, experienced a suicide within a year of our uh, conducting the survey. Nine out of the 11 suicides that we are aware of occurred in some factories where over 10% of workers uh, showed signs of anxiety or depression. And that 10% uh, is a halfway mark. So half of the factories are on the left side of that line and half of the factories are on the right side of that line. Uh, what's more, if we focus on that upper right quadrant, so this is um, factories where more workers reported that they were excessively tired and more workers reported that they were depressed. There are 15 factories in that fall within that group and seven of them, almost half, experienced a suicide. So you can again begin to see why we start to feel that this is very conclusive evidence of the link between employment conditions and the risk of suicide. Um, uh, to shift, of course, fatigue is related to productivity requirements, and we also see uh, the tension of, or the stress of productivity requirements related to hostility. Uh, uh, we can see, for example, uh, that eight out of 11 suicides occurred where uh, workers were more likely to say the, the, the uh, productivity requirements of this factory are unreasonable, I'm expected to work too fast or too intensely. Um, and we also see that that perception of productivity is very strongly linked to whether or not workers work well with their supervisors. Uh, you'll forgive me, I'm trying to um, work through these uh, select findings uh, on a time limit, so I'm going to continue. I, we'll, we'll have time for questions. Um, when those, th that relationship with supervisors or with security personnel worsens, or sometimes it's also the relationship between workers, uh, we see uh, violence. Uh, we see workers reporting independently uh, uh, fistfights, injuries uh, on the shop floor from, from fistfights. And not coincidentally, 10 out of 11 suicides occurred in those factories where workers were more likely to to report fistfights on the shop floor. <clears throat> What's more, if we look at the 14 factories that were both more likely to report fistfights and more likely to see workers feeling depressed, eight of them experienced suicides, over half. Uh, again, it's, it's, we can really um, uh, see the effects of employment conditions. Uh, to just highlight maybe a final point um, I think it's also important, again, to stress that the links between employment conditions and suicide are not obvious. So I, I started also by saying that Foxconn is known not to be the, uh, the, the lowest paying employer uh, in, in China. Uh, we see this in our own survey results where uh, factories that experience suicides uh, generally were not the lowest, uh, offering the lowest income. They were, however, where workers tended to believe their income is too low. So they might agree that the, the, the income exceeded government requirements, minimum wage requirements in the region. Um, but eight out of 11 suicides <coughs> that we know of in this data set occurred where workers felt <coughs> that their income is too low and also where workers were willing to resign over, over their income being too low. Um, we also see the issue of income of differences between workers, uh, and I recognize the time, Martina. I think. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, we also see that uh, differences between workers are very important. So, workers' concept of fairness is very relevant to whether they feel depressed, um, and and this makes uh, theoretical sense in the sense that when workers feel that they cannot improve their income, 
through merit, through effort, through seniority, through things that they typically would <coughs> expect to receive more income for, <coughs> they begin to feel more hopeless, and this is known to trigger suicide. Now, um, because of time, I'm going to stop here, but uh, I would say that one thing we are trying to move forward, uh, so a, a sort of a last point, and this is others, uh, there's an entire section of this in our report, so if you're interested, please do review the report. Um, we want to uh, address this risk. We want to intervene to reduce the number of suicides, prevent them where possible, improve those key working conditions that are linked to the risk of suicide. And we will do that more effectively if we can predict where suicides are more likely. So what we did within the, in the third methodology where we did the field work was try to identify high risk suppliers. And the, the short version uh, of this is that we found lots of new suicides, a lot of violence, uh, homicides, uh, even after our field work, I'm talking now within the last month, we've had reports from one of the factories we visited of an attempted murder by a worker of another worker and of a new suicide uh, by a worker. So I believe that this is reinforcing that the, the sort of the methodology that we're trying to build to identify the risk of suicide is producing some results and we hope we can use this in collaboration with the industry to develop effective interventions and, and try to stop the needless loss of life. I will end there and thank you very much. Okay, uh, thank you so much, uh, Dimitri, for this presentation. We are going to go to questions and answers. And um, <coughs> before we do, uh, we would like to say just a couple of quick words about how we see the path forward, because that is, of course, the point. Where do we go from here? And so from Electronics Watch's perspective first, we believe that this path should be informed by uh, three principles. The first, joint responsibility, collaboration, and transparency and public accountability. Uh, first on joint responsibility. While, of course, employers are responsible for harmful working conditions, the responsibility to ensure that the employment conditions do not contribute to suicides uh, should not rest entirely with employers. As we saw in Dimitri's presentation, there are cycles of influence. Clients sometimes drive the momentum that creates stressful and possibly even hostile work environments. And to some extent, clients do respond to consumer preferences. In addition, uh, government has a role to foster um, respect for worker rights in these factories. So there is a joint responsibility among all these actors. Therefore, the issues that are identified in this webinar should, of course, be addressed through a collaborative process that include companies, civil society, experts, public buyers, and government. And we believe that this process must be guided by trust and transparency and include public reporting. Uh, and we will look forward to developing this path in collaboration with industry and others over the coming months. Um, and now I believe that Deborah Albers is up with us from the Responsible Business Alliance and would like to share a word about their perspective on the way, on the way forward. Hi, Ben. This is Deborah. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Well, thank you for the opportunity to speak for just a moment um, on the webinar. Um, as you and I have discussed, even one suicide in the electronics industry is too many. It's such a challenge because we can't know the factors that contribute to the unfortunate event of when someone takes their life. Poor working conditions may exacerbate that. Um, and that is the space that we work in. Uh, you know, we work in, uh, and all of our members, we work to improve the quality of life of the workers and make sure that those working conditions are good. But where we focus is on, we're interested in focusing on systemic solutions, um, not so much a site or a factory, but the entire system. The, the concept, and I can't remember who said this, but a rising tide lifts all boats. So we want to look at the industry level. We want to be forward looking. Uh, this issue is just not going to be solved by one employer, by one company. It, it's going to be solved by, if to the extent with which we can even influence it, 
to um, the collective efforts of many people. And, and in that spirit, we are interested in collaboration as well at the industry level. Um, RBA wants to participate in that and we're willing to get together at some kind of a face-to-face -face meeting and look through the research that you are going to provide and have that be a starting point for discussions that we might be able to extend over, say, a year-long period with the objective of finding three to five meaningful actions that we could take as an industry uh, to, to work on this issue. Now, it, you may know that we have an event in May called the Leadership Circle and we thought that that might be a good opportunity, as you talked about transparency, to kind of have a, an output at the end of the year to see the progress that's been made and possibly a report at that time. So the idea is, again, we would be interested in working together on a project, a multi-stakeholder type of thing for a year to really focus on an industry level or multiple industry level solutions and uh, involve the public buyers. We've done this before with some other issues and it really helps to elevate the topic when you do have a multi-stakeholder event and you're working on that industry level solution. So I just wanted to offer that on this, on this call. Thank you so much, Deborah, and thank you for being part of this webinar and speaking on behalf of Responsible Business Alliance. We appreciate uh, your ideas and your outreach and your invitation, and we do look forward to building this uh, process together. Um, now, uh, I think it's high time that we go to questions and answer uh, questions and then answers. And I think Peter, uh, you are unmuted, yes, and um, may have received some questions. Yes. Uh, so one uh, one of the first question I I got was um, uh, focused on 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 um, production process. So so it's it goes like this. We uh, what we know from academic research and reports from labor rights groups is that production process in the electronics industry is characterized by a high level of fragmentation and tellerization. So workers have to to the small number of tasks over and over again, and you you relate it to, to this Dimitri. Um, what do you think uh, would a more modern approach to organizing the production, say job enrichment or job enlargement, would this be a way to mitigate the negative work environment you described? Uh, so, sorry, Peter. Can you uh, repeat the question? Okay. Was I was I not, oh, oh, okay? No, that was uh, I, I was writing a message and, and got my. Oh, uh, I see. I see. I see. So, so, so the the, the question re relates to how work is organized. So uh, currently, very often it's very very fragmented. Uh, workers have to to do this mail uh, some same small number of tasks over and over again, and this is also what you described and. The yes. question goes a bit more towards how, how modern uh, production process approaches like job enrichment or job enlargement could mitigate this negative work environment. Uh, I definitely think that there is a role for that. Um, I think uh, the, the climate, uh, both competitive pressures, maybe cost considerations, uh, as well as the mindset of, uh, of management in China has uh, generally sort of preferred the more simplified uh, separation uh, or division of tasks. So that, that monotony of work is maybe more extreme in China than it might be elsewhere, uh, certainly in electronics factories in the West. So uh, certainly I believe that uh, principles of enrichment of work and some uh, different organization of work and the division of tasks could help uh, mitigate some of these risks. The degree to which that could happen, uh, both in terms of what's possible for production and what would impact the risk of suicide, that's beyond m m my, my uh, knowledge. So that, that would be something that we would need to test. Okay, um, the next question is more about industry um, or um, when you look at, at your sample, you probably did have a, a, a various um, lo uh, operations, locations, and factories. So, 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 so this is more about company size. Do you, do you, uh, did you find any relation between the likelihood of suicide incidents and com company size in your research? Uh, 
Yes, uh, so that matters. Uh, it definitely matters. Now, and, and that matters even, uh, so with Foxconn, it's obviously more visible because Foxconn is employing a million people. In our survey data, uh, I think the average factory size was only about a thousand employees. Um, and we see that the risk of, uh, of a suicide occurring uh, is significantly higher once the factories are at a size of about 4,000 employees. Uh, so I think size does matter. I don't think, uh, I, I think this is an issue that needs further exploring. So one of the things that we also uh, identify in the report, I didn't mention it in this presentation, but uh, youth seems to be a factor that, that the younger workforces uh, have a higher risk of suicide. Uh, and it also happens to be that uh, larger factories seem to hire younger workforces. Uh, there's a lot to unpack there. I, I won't comment on that now, but it's not. It's so uh, size matters in this context. It matters on multiple levels, not just because you have more employees, you're more likely to see one case of suicide. Uh, I, I think that, that we just need to do more work. Uh, my hope is that through collaboration with the industry, we would be able to have much more robust data that would allow us to tease out these different factors. Okay, thanks. Uh, next question would be, if you believe multiple motives behind suicides or suicidal attempts, then how did you arrive at a sweeping conclusion that this was driven by working conditions? What was the methodology you used for sampling and taking out other causations in your study? I would say that it's very difficult to focus on a single causation, and we did not try to do that. So uh, the, the argumentation of this study is not that social factors don't matter. Uh, it's not that migration, for example, doesn't contribute to the insecurity uh, that workers feel in their lives. It's not that you know, maybe it is that workers in some of the poorest families who are uh, experiencing higher levels of stress are more likely to commit suicide. All of those factors uh, may uh, be true. They weren't the focus of this study. This study really focused on if we look at the trend of suicides, uh, we have to ask us why almost all suicides are occurring in factories that have a particular set of, uh, of, of conditions. Uh, and uh, I believe that that is fairly uh, conclusive evidence of the role of employment conditions there. That doesn't mean to, to say that uh, employment conditions were the sole uh, contributing factor. They may not even be the major factor in an individual suicide. But overall, we clearly see that the risk of suicide is limited to factories with certain conditions. Mm -hmm. And a follow-up from uh, the same person is: uh, Did you did you in any way were uh, or were you in any any way able to compare this to uh, uh, motives or incident rates in Western countries or uh, at least in countries outside of China? I am currently aware of, and I've had brief conversations with sort of experts uh, on the topic of, of suicides and, and experts who are interested specifically in the role of employment conditions uh, and the link to suicide in other countries. Uh, but those have been very sort of uh, just the beginning uh, of, of conversation. So we really focused on the Chinese context here. And again, I don't want people like with our focus on the electronic sector to sort of judge our silence on these other issues as conclusions of this or that. We really don't know. We need to do that, that work. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, next question is more about uh, what is being done. So um, the, the, um, could you talk a bit about the role of local Chinese labor activists in uh, addressing the risks of suicide. So what is happening on the ground? Yes, uh, well, to be fair, I think uh, activists have struggled with this, and I don't think it's been visible to even most workers' rights groups in China. Uh, I think there was obviously a, a focus on Foxconn, and there has been also a tension on Apple, as NGOs were talking about suicide, because the Foxconn example was the most obvious. Uh, few, uh, I think, people recognized the risk of suicides beyond. It is obviously when, when uh, 
works rights groups come across information about a suicide, they generally include it in their reports. And there are reports of factories that have, quote unquote, a suicide problem where you see sometimes a, a quite modestly sized factory that is seeing multiple suicides over the years and, and uh, sort of monitoring reports <coughs> by workers' rights groups are drawing attention to that issue. But I think uh, people haven't recognized it as a systemic trend. Um, and I think uh, a, a valid critique has been that uh, the, the, the argument so far has been that <coughs> if you are seeing suicide, then your employment conditions must be terrible. Uh, and that's not the, 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 the role of employment conditions in the risk of suicide is more complicated than that. It's not that the worst employers, for example, necessarily are going to see the highest risk of suicide. Uh, it's a particular set of conditions that, that contribute to suicide. Uh, I think there's a lot of interest by uh, workers' rights groups in this topic. Uh, there are a few, uh, I would say, uh, China Labor Watch in, based in New York. Uh, they haven't really um, published anything sort of uh, like a systemic review uh, of suicides uh, that they've seen, but they've made references and allusions in their reports to having received information about uh, tens of suicides. Uh, so, so I think they're aware of the issue, but they haven't really reported uh, this, uh, in depth on it. Mm -hmm. Thanks. N another question was um, more on an industry view. Uh, so the issues relating to employment conditions uh, you described are well known and are industry-wide and are not specific to a uh, single factory, a manufacturer or a brand. So uh, the, uh, the need to take a supply chain perspective that involves all stakeholders and especially the most powerful ones, brand name companies, is obvious. Uh, could you elaborate a bit on what role you see in, uh, in, in, in brands to mitigate this, uh, these issues? Yes, um, let me preface that by saying I do think <coughs> certainly right now, we don't have uh, evidence or knowledge to suggest that one brand is more responsible to the other. Uh, the issue is certainly sector-wide. Um, that said, I don't think, uh, so um, for example, uh, I mentioned the role of violence and the connection to work of depression and, and also suicide. Uh, I don't think it's the average factory that sees violence on the shop floor. It's very common for supervisors to shout at workers. It's, it's, I think, much less common for supervisors to hit workers. And then uh, some of the, the, the more extreme incidents that we, we see, um, this is maybe more suggestive, not conclusive, still to be determined, but <clears throat> I definitely believe that this is still uh, not every factory. There are some factories that are using coercion more than others. Uh, there are some factories that are crossing certain lines versus others. So w we still need that collaborative and industry approach. In terms of responding, I think uh, some of the obvious things are, uh, for example, to uh, protect workers' freedom to refuse excessive overtime. Uh, this is very, very key, and it would have, I think, very systematic uh, sort of repercussions for the entire industry. If workers could say, I've put in my time this week, I'm not comfortable doing overtime, I need a break. Uh, that's already going to help protect uh, workers. Uh, giving workers the freedom to resign, it's also quite common for uh, factories to uh, basically use about a month's worth of wages <coughs> as a threat to workers. If you don't resign when I say it's okay to resign, then you're gonna lose this month's worth of income. And that may seem like it's not worth uh, committing suicide over, uh, but we do, uh, the, the dynamics of suicide are complicated and I definitely believe the evidence suggests that these restrictions on freedom to resign uh, create this condition, these conditions on the shop floor uh, that make it much more likely that factories will go beyond workers' limits. Um, support for collective bargaining on some level, I think, uh, needs to happen. And I understand that this is a complicated issue in China, and I don't pretend to have easy solutions that are implementable. But I think what we're seeing is we can't uh, determine 
working conditions through the theory of sort of engineering or whatnot. That needs to be in dialogue with real workers who are empowered to be able to represent uh, their views and their experience on the shop floor. Uh, and, uh, and that's obviously a much longer conversation. Okay. Um, so I have one more question on my list uh, for anybody who still has some, some unresolved issues, some questions, some, some just details they want to know, please send, send me a private message and I will forward this to, to uh, Dimitri. Uh, the, the, the last question is currently on my list is uh, focused on methodology and it asks, um, uh, about your sample size and the relations uh, of both of workers and of plants and the relations uh, of these sample sizes towards the entire population in China, so the, the entire employed population in China. Could you, sorry, could you uh, just repeat the last bit of it? How does it fit with uh, the proportion of the larger population? Was that the question? Yeah, so, so basically the, uh, the population employed in China. Yes, uh, so this is uh, very much a sample in terms of the size of the electronic sector. <coughs> I, uh, I, I, I don't want to claim how far this can be representative. I also think there's a lot of diversity within the electronic sector that is not in either the, the review of internet sources that we did or in uh, the, the, the data, the, the more sort of uh, precise data that we have. Uh, what I think, answering these questions always requires some kind of pragmatic view of what evidence is possible to collect. We can think theoretically about the ideal that we would have. Um, this is uh, what we've done really goes beyond what's been done before um, and uh, it represents I think a significant step and there are clear conclusions that can come from that. Do they need to be verified? Will we find variations? Will there be sort of maybe risk is more concentrated in some types of product lines for example versus others? I think that's likely. Uh, we, we need to do more work um, but I still think that we have a significant uh, enough size in in the work that we've done in the, the 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 data that we have to suggest this is a very serious issue which has wide effects on the industry uh, we recognize instinctually i think other our other respondents have, have mentioned it that if the conditions that we're talking about uh, aren't limited to you know two or three or four factories uh, they're they're possibly not even limited to uh, the electronics sector uh, so uh, there's a lot more work to be done, uh, but I think it's clear that employment conditions contribute to suicides and that should not be happening where those conditions are dependent on a violation of workers' rights, on the use of coercion and sometimes violence to force workers to work hours that, they're not ex that they are excessive beyond the law and workers don't accept, where there's a refusal to sort of meet with workers to discuss more uh, appropriate sort of uh, income and benefits packages. Uh, and here, I think there is some benefit to the industry here as well. I think uh, <coughs> a, a shop floor that uh, is kind of influenced by the threat of violence, uh, where there's kind of uh, privileges given by supervisors and hostility and conflict between supervisors and, and workers who maybe work more slowly or for whatever reason, that's an unhealthy and unproductive way of dealing with the challenges that, that, that the industry faces. So I think if we have a constructive approach to this issue, uh, it is possible to find some win-wins and, and, and implement them more widely. Okay, thank you, Dimitri. From my side, I have no more questions on my list. So I would now um, hand over again to Bjorn so he can uh, finish and finalize this. Sure. Well, thank you very much. Uh, actually, we have one, one minute. Uh, Dimitri, could you answer this question in one minute? I'll try. Uh, okay. Uh, what, what, what were the top surprises? What were the top learnings that you, uh, you know, something that you did not expect to find? Well, I, I didn't expect to find suicide, to tell you the truth. I mean, uh, we came to this, uh, for us, suicide was Box guns. I mean, we, we, we had the kind of ordinary citizens view of the issue. We had seen all the publicity around Foxconn. And it's only because we were doing these surveys 
uh, widely through the electronic sector, and we started getting reports. It's mentioned in the report. I didn't mention in this presentation, but the survey doesn't directly ask questions about suicide, but we asked workers, what kind of injuries do you see? What kind of health and safety <coughs> accidents are you seeing? And we got 20% of factories, uh, workers from 20% of factories telling, telling us someone jumped from a building, someone committed suicide. Uh, and that was, I think, uh, by far the biggest surprise. And that's what drove all of this work. Okay, well, there, thank you. It remains for me to thank you, Dimitri, to thank all the participants in this webinar, and also to invite you to stay, stay connected, to contact us. Uh, you may have questions that weren't entirely answered, or you may have comments, or you may wanna um, contribute in some way help to guide the way forward, and all those inputs are very, very welcome. Um, this webinar series is part of the Make ICT Fair project that is funded by the European Union. And like other webinars, a recording of this webinar will be available shortly on the Electronics Watch website. Thank you so much again, and we hope that uh, this webinar will be the beginning of a process, a collaborative process forward, and that we will uh, convene again in, in a year's time to, to see some uh, measurable advances that we have made together. Thank you so much, and that concludes today's webinar. Thank you.